morning. Good morning. Our first lectionary reading is from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 27 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of humans and the seed of animals. And just as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring evil, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall no longer say, The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But all shall die for their own sins. The teeth of everyone who eats sour grapes shall be set on edge. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all, shall, shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning. Good morning. Just saw Hunter come in. Welcome back. <laughs> we had a we had a tour group in from Illinois um, this last week, and one lady came decked out in UK stuff. Her granddaughter goes there. I told her I told her she could stay. So <laughs> she's welcome anytime. All right. Second lectionary reading is Second Timothy verse or chapter thirteen verses fourteen through chapter four verse five. But as for you, continue in what you have, what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you from salvation through, through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and in, the king, and in his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim, proclaim the message, be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience and teaching, for the time is coming when people will, will put up with sound doctrine, will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Let's turn to page 750, 750 for Psalm 19. <coughs> The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them God has set a tent for the sun, which comes forth like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and runs its course with joy like a strong man. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are true, and the righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can understand one's own errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Also keep your servant from the insolent, and let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of the great transgression. 
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. This is the word of God for the people of God. It's good to be in God's house this morning. I missed you all last Sunday, but I got to hear Shad Walters preach. And you talk about a little young man that's on fire for the Lord. Shad is on fire. And if you had known Shad when I knew him and he worked with us at the bank about 10 years ago, you would be amazed at the miracle that God's performed in him and filled his heart with his love and, and his uh, message that he has for everybody. It was just a blessing. Just a blessing. And I had to shed a few tears. But I was thankful to have that opportunity to get to hear him. Today for announcements, our Snively Fall celebration is this afternoon at three, from 3 to 5, and Ron has checked out the bottom, and it's all good. Uh, Christmas cantata practice is every Wednesday at 5.30. Our October activities, on the 13th we can begin, don which was last week, donations of food or money for the 15 Thanksgiving food baskets for families in the Johns Creek, Coon Creek, and Bent Branch area. Uh, please check your donations and make sure the expiration date is up to December 31st. Put donations on the designate, designated table in the fellowship hall. The baskets will be put together and delivered 11:18 uh, to 11:20. As you can see, we got our shoe boxes this week. So pick up your shoe box and pamphlet, and they're due back on November the 10th. Make your check out to the Salem United Methodist Church and attach it to the top of the box. Other November activities on the 3rd is All Saints Day celebration with dinner at Gaddy's after service, and if the kids bring someone that Sunday, they can get an extra game card for the playroom. On that same day is the charge conference at Vogel Day United Methodist Church. Our fellowship Prayer Fellowship Church this month is the Whites Creek United Methodist Church in Catlicksburg, Kentucky. And singers are needed for the community cantata with Mita Baptist. They have their practice on Sunday from 4.30 to 5.30 at Mita Baptist Church. Any other announcements? Why don't we go ahead and, and uh, while we're praying, we'll pray for the shoe boxes. So if you would like to come up and uh, get one of the shoe boxes and stand here. Uh, we will we'll pray over them today. So everyone, we think about the uh, the places around the world that these will go to, and the children that will be touched by these, and just to know that uh, in some places they don't get anything like this, and so just imagine the. The joy on their faces as they open these presents today. Uh, so let's pray. Father, today we come before you and we give you thanks that we can be blessed enough to be a blessing to others. What a wonderful, wonderful gift you've given us. And so I pray, Father, that you would... Uh, speak to our hearts, and, and God, just touch these gifts and multiply them around the world. As many, 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 many churches will do this very thing. And as we assemble these and prepare them with prayerful attitude of, of the child that we don't even know will receive these. God, may there be a special blessing. May they see the love of Christ through these and receive just a wonderful blessing from this. I pray, God, you'd bless those that give and bless those that have not to give this morning. And God, we want to pray for our service. We want to pray, God, that you'd lead us and guide us today. And God, ask you to forgive us of our sins. We pray the Holy Spirit would just be present here today. And Lord, today we pray for our leaders, our country. And God, we know that... Uh, we know, God, that we live in a world where bad things happen. We see it all the time, but we're thankful, God, that you are always with us. We pray for those that are on our prayer hearts today, Lord, for uh, Roger and for uh, what's going on there with the family, Lord. And, and we pray for Cindy and these other prayer requests that have been mentioned here today, Lord. People that are recovering and people that are sick, people that are hurting. And we just pray your will be done here today. 
And we praise you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think by 3 o'clock that the sun will be out. So I think it'll be a good day down there. Our sermon text is taken from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. And there was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. And for a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection lest by continually coming she wear me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now shall not God bring about justice for his elect, who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Let us pray. Father, we pray for justice on the earth, but justice in the way that you would have, Father. And we pray for, again, the courage to go forth and seek that in our community. Bless our pastor as he brings the word and opens it to us this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We are saved by grace. And uh, God done the work for us. God is the one who did everything necessary for us to be qualified for heaven. And we don't add to that. But having said that, I think that we have to realize that uh, we are not exempt from responsibility in the Christian life. That God has called us all to, to be what he'd have us to be and to do what he'd have us to do. Sometimes um, we are people who want to uh, see certain things happen. And we expect things to turn out a certain way. And when they don't, we can lose heart we can become disillusioned and even sometimes bitter and angry. And so I think this is a parable about persistence. And it's so much more. But in this parable, we, we want to be careful that we don't uh, read too much into it because sometimes we have a tendency to... Um, to read too much into things and, and miss the point. There's usually a point, and sometimes more than one, but at least one main point. And, uh, and so we want to look at that today. And this parable is about this lady who comes to a judge who is an unjust judge, by the way. And so we must be careful not to say, well, this guy, this judge represents God because He's really, God is nothing like this person. He's very unjust. He doesn't care about people, and he doesn't care about the law. He's not willing, you know, to take care of her situation because it's the right thing to do, which, you know, which should be the thing. He's not willing to do it because the law, maybe uh, he understands the fine points of the law. In fact, he ignores her. Now, this lady who comes to him is a widow. 
And we understand that in the Bible days, uh, and even somewhat today, but especially then, widows were very vulnerable people. They were often preyed upon by society and taken advantage of. They were uh, so vulnerable that many people could, uh, could hurt them and take advantage of them without any repercussions. You know, it's sad to look at some of the history of this, and, and we, we've seen it many times. But here's a lady who, who comes to this judge and wants him to do something about her situation. Maybe someone has, has uh, taken advantage of her. Maybe someone has uh, taken what she had, uh, done something terrible to her, and she has at least a legal problem here that by law she has a right to be defended and taken care of. But instead of that, the judge just ignores her cries. So she continues to knock, and she continues to knock, and she continues to aggravate him. She leaves him messages on his phone and texts him and, and sends him letters in the mail, and she continues to aggravate him till finally he says, I, I, I don't care anything about this person or what she's talking about, but she's aggravating me to death. So I'm going to do this for her. And so I think today, if nothing else that we can take away from this sermon, if you just get one thing, is that, is that we keep knocking. And that we don't give up. Now, again, looking at this passage, there's a lot to unpack here. But basically you have a, a, a parable about, he starts off talking about prayer, Jesus said. But then he goes into talking about uh, justice, a woman wanting justice. And so that's involved, and we live in a world today where a lot of people are uh, taken advantage of, and evil, evil things happen in this world, and we think about all the, the things that go on, uh, not just in our country, but in other places, with people that uh, are in other countries that are being taken advantage of, and by the uh, ISIS people who, who go into these cities, and we think about the, the young ladies that they've taken, and they've... they've sold them into uh, sex trafficking and uh, just all these terrible things that are done that people do today. And here's a woman who wants justice. And I think sometimes that we live in a world where we also may cry out, how long, O oh Lord? How long before you intervene? And how long is this going to go on? And how long do I have to suffer? And how long? And maybe you've prayed and you've asked God and, and it hasn't, you know, been the way you want it to be. But I want you to know that God says to you, I hear you. And I'm not like that unjust judge, but the problem is sometimes that we don't know the mind of God and we don't know God's timetable, but God is going to set all things right and he's going to make all things right eventually. And Jesus says that when he comes, shall he find faith on the earth. And so it's also a parable about keeping faith in the midst of trying to get an answer of whatever it is you're trying to get. And sometimes, yes, it feels like God is a million miles away, and it feels like that our prayers aren't going higher than the ceiling, and it just, we feel like, what's the point and why do we keep going? And yet we're reminded to keep knocking. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you fi shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. But there's those times when I've asked and I've seek and I've knocked. And I haven't gotten what I thought I should have gotten. And I feel sometimes discouraged. And I ask God, how long, O oh Lord? There's this also an eschatological uh, aspect to this parable in, in, in the sense that Jesus is talking about coming back someday. And he's talking about the future, the end times. And that he says, when he returns, and he says he will de deliver Justice speedily. And so there's a sense here that we have to understand that it may not happen exactly when we want it to or think it should, but God is going to come back someday, and he is going to set all things straight. 
And so we look for that, and we understand that there's, come, there's a day of reckoning. There is a day of reckoning when all these things are going to happen, and we have to just trust God in that. And so our part, Jesus says, is not to lose heart, to keep, keep on keeping on, to keep praying, and just leave it the rest up to God. There are those people who, who will say to me, you know, I, I just feel, uh, I feel like I'm far away from God. And I feel like God isn't answering my prayers. And I, 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 my marriage is suffering, or, or this is suffering in my life, and, and all these things. And then I ask them, what are you doing about it? Where's your part in this relationship? Well, I ain't been to church in a while. In fact, I, I've been missing a whole lot. I haven't been praying much. Have, we haven't been doing our devotions much. And so it's no wonder that we feel away from God. It's no wonder that we feel uh, that, that God is a million miles away because we, and by the way, you, you know the old saying that, that if God has seemed like he's not close to you anymore, guess who moved? Give, let me give you this parable. A man and a woman get married. And, uh, they, you know, they go off on their honeymoon and all that. Then they come back and the man leaves and he goes on a trip. And she expects him back for a couple days and he doesn't come back. Days turn into months and months turns into years. Finally, one day, the man shows up after years, comes in the house, and walks in like nothing's changed, only to find out that she has moved on. She's had the marriage annulled, and by this time, she's remarried. And he's like, what happened to our vows? Like, you know, what happened to the fact that, you know, you love me, and you said you never, uh, this had never changed? What happened? Well, that's exactly what we do to God sometimes. We, we, we treat God like he is, uh, you know, someone that we don't have anything to do with. And then we wonder why we feel distant from God. You see, in the church, we have these things that we call traditions. And I know some people don't like tradition, but we uh, Methodists are very methodical about those things. But we do that on purpose because we understand that we need certain things in our life that are traditional. We need those uh, disciplines in our life to remind us every Sunday and every time we come to church what we're here for and what it's all about. And that's why we read scriptures and we have litanies and we do these things as a, a tradition. Because it's something that's been ingrained in us. And every time we do it, when we do communion and we do these litanies and we read the responsive readings and the scriptural readings and all this and all these things that people say, why do we do that? It's because the word of God is being ingrained in us and we are making it a part. It's important that we do these traditions and that we keep on keeping on, keep on keeping on. You see, the prayer is more than just a one time getting on our knees. Prayer is a life. It's an attitude. It's everything that we do and we say to God is our prayer. Our life is a prayer, really. And so our relationship with God is involved in here. And I think God is saying to us that we need to keep, keep, keep on keeping on. It's all part of the Christian life. And uh, this morning I asked Mark to pray for me. Uh, just feeling a little discombobulated this morning with all that's going on. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, I don't want to preach a message on prayer without prayer, really. But how important prayer is in our life. I think sometimes we live in a world of such instant gratification that we expect a Christian life to be that way. You know, and we can get... Uh, oatmeal in a minute, we can get boiled eggs in three minutes, we can get uh, all these things in just instantly. We can drive through, we expect to get our food right then, 
And when it comes to the Christian life, we want that same thing to happen. And we expect that we're going we're gonna to read something or we're going to go to church and all of a sudden it's all there. But it doesn't work that way. It takes years and years of tradition and discipline to mature and to grow in the Christian that God wants us to be. It's something that we keep working at and we keep doing. It doesn't happen overnight. And so we continue to read scriptures and we continue to do these things and we sing songs and we do these things because it's part of what helps us grow. It's kind of like having a friend, you know. Uh, friendship is something that develops over time. You don't, uh, you don't become really close friends just uh, overnight, usually. And I know we today, we, we use that term loosely. We have uh, a 599,000 friends on Facebook. And we don't know half of them, and they would, most of them would, would not come in the middle of the night to get us out of jail if we were in jail, right? So that's not a friend. Hopefully that don't happen, but anyway, you know, and, and we call them friends. But, you know, Jesus, when he used that word friend, he used a term there with the disciples. He said, you know, they, they were, in a sense, willing to be his slaves. Doulos in the Greek, slave. And I am bound to you, and you're my master. And that's the kind of relationship that, that you have with God, the master-servant-slave relationship, where you bow down to him. But Jesus said, from henceforth, I'm not going to call you slave. I'm going to call you friend. Friend. Jesus, the master of the universe, decided to call me his friend. Which means that it, it's a totally different dynamic here. And so it's not just I'm doing all this because I'm his slave, although I want to be. And I'm not doing this because I have to, but out of a heart of love and a heart of expressing my desire and gratitude to God for what he's done for me, I can call him friend. What a relationship. What a dynamic that we have with God that, you, we, you know, we get this picture of God as some mean judge up there in the sky. And then we begin to see that he wants to be our friend. Man. And so being a friend to someone takes time, takes effort. Sometimes there's long hours of communication, prayer. There are times where you get a call in the middle of the night and you go to them. Or you hear uh, your friend uh, has lost someone in their life and you get in your car and you drive miles. When my father passed away from a car wreck, I was pastoring a church in West Virginia, Beckley, West Virginia. And my father in Paintsville. And I drove to Paintsville. And the piano player and her husband drove all the way from Beckley, West Virginia to Paintsville to be at the funeral. And she even played the piano. See, that's a friend. Right now, I could call them and I could say, I need a place to stay. And I know that I would have a place. That's a friend. And Jesus wants us to have that kind of relationship where we, we continue to knock. Not because he doesn't hear or he doesn't want to help us. But he wants us to understand that we don't lose heart even when things don't go our way. I mentioned my father. I remember my mother praying for my dad to get saved. Every time we went to church, and I was just a young boy, and I didn't understand much about it then, but every time we went to church, I remember when they asked for prayer requests, she always said, please pray for my husband. He's lost. Every time. I remember many times her praying for him. And then he was, he was a pretty rough character. Dad was an alcoholic. He, he managed to function, but he also was a bootlegger and a lot of other things, gambler, and a bit of a carouser. And I'll be honest with you, I never, I never thought I'd see the day. 
But I went to a revival, uh, to help in a revival when I was about 19 years old with uh, an evangelist. And we were up in the, outside of Columbus, Ohio doing a revival. And I got a phone call, and it was my mom. And she said, your dad wants to talk to you. And uh, she, so dad I, I picked up the phone and said, son, I didn't know what it was. He said, I want you to know I got saved tonight. I'm getting baptized tomorrow, and I'd love for you to come and help baptize me. What a wonderful day. What a wonderful day to be able to walk down to this, what we call the watery grave, and baptize my own dad. And what a change God made in his life. I remember at the time I was still living at home, and, and many times it come in, uh, at, at night, and, and he would say, come in and let's have prayer. Let's, let's pray before we go to bed. And he would ask me to pray every night. Got to come and hear me preach. But my mom was one of those who never gave up. Years, years, I'm saying years, she continued to pray for my dad. And that's the kind of persistence that Christ is talking about today. When the Lord comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Yes. Yes, he will. He'll still find people down on their knees. Still find people praying. How long, O oh Lord? We don't know. But we'll continue to pray, come, Lord Jesus. Come. We're going to sing that song in a little bit, Kumbaya. Come by here. Lord, we want you to come to this place and visit us today. And so, I encourage you today, keep on keeping on. Keep that relationship going. And if you've drifted away a little bit, try to find a place back because I see it all the time. Lives are destroyed, but it's all because we've not kept up our part of the bargain with God. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. Let's pray. Father, today it's it's true that we do get discouraged, that we do get frustrated. And we see all the injustice things that happen in the world and even the things that have happened to us, and we want to cry out, Why me? Why now? God, help us to leave the wise up to you and help us to do our part in this, Lord, in our relationship to you, in our relationship to others, in our work, in our community, and in the world that we keep on keeping on, that we keep knocking. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.